9 to 10 Freddy in the bathroom. Freddy is in an odd situation when you look at things from an outsider's perspective. Sure, we know he likes to hide from the camera, and technically these robots have no sense of biological sex, but like, come on, Freddy. You should know not to hide in the girl's bathroom no matter what, unless you want to get cancelled. However, that's not the scary part. Even though AI sentient enough to have that kind of crisis coming was pretty damn terrifying. The scary part is that what if we've been wrong this whole time? What if Chica isn't the only girl in the series? If Freddy is also a female, this could flip everything on its head. If we can't even understand who Freddy is meant to be, can we really trust anything we know about the series? We thought Scott threw a curveball when he added himself canonically into the games, but what would happen if Freddy was female? Oh boy, I'm having an existential crisis now. 9 Scrapped Features It turns out FNAF had a whole load of features planned that were never actually implemented fully or that were changed last minute. I talked about how Freddy was only meant to jump scare you after you lost power in another video, and I talked about a few others in different FNAF lists. If you guys want a whole list on Scrapped FNAF features, let me know in the comments. Is it something that people would actually want because it's something that I want to do? Or is it more so something that I do just to talk about things? And change things up because we're kind of running out of FNAF lists. If you have any ideas, let me know. When I look at these features that I want to keep hidden for the purposes of another list, if you want it at least, I can only imagine how different the game would be if they had added these things like alarms for every hour or animatronics coming down other hallways. It would have changed the game and potentially made it worse for wear. Number 8 Afton's Flesh In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, we were introduced to the character known as Springtrap, the Golden Springlock Bonnie suit with William Afton barely clinging to life inside. He has been poked and prodded more than people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And while he is still alive, it appears as if he's just been rotting away or hell, even just gotten his skin torn off when the spring lock's activated, resulting in getting spiked in multiple places, but still somehow surviving. In some of the scenes slash menus we can get in Five Nights 3, we can actually see that this is the case. As we get a close look at Springtrap with his mouth open, revealing the hardly living body of William Afton inside. His skin has been peeled off from the looks of it, or it is at least extremely raw, but no mistake, that is old Willie Afton sitting in that suit. This can be seen regularly and there's no need to really do anything specific to see it, but it does require a keen eye and I can tell you I never noticed it. I can't even see the ketchup when it's right in front of me, let alone something hidden underneath a golden spring bonnie suit. And it's 7 Cupcake. Also in front of that same alcove, we can see a few frames of Chica's famous cupcake in a display case, almost like it's a museum, or perhaps a memoriam to the old design of Chica that they had to abandon for this establishment, or because the fans love the cupcake and would be furious if it wasn't here in some capacity. There looks to be a plaque on the front of the display as well, indicating that maybe it's a bit of a showcase for the cupcakes and perhaps it's history with the character of Chica. Maybe the Fazbear Entertainment Company is trying to push sugary foods less, or maybe they just want to get rid of the cupcakes since it was involved with a version of Chica that was possessed by the soul of a child after Afton offered them more pizza. Maybe this whole area is dedicated to ensuring the reign of Afton never comes back. <laughs> Good luck with that. Someone didn't listen to him when he says he always comes back, and obviously someone didn't look at the final shot of that trailer. Unit 6, The Hidden Skull. Man, FNAF 3 has a lot going for it, doesn't it? The FNAF 3 minigames are honestly the main game of FNAF 3. You gotta play them to get the right combo of numbers to dial into a brick wall, then you gotta click the toy bonnie on your desk to get the glitch minigames, and then you need to put five kids to rest in order to get the good canon ending to the game. However, if you really pay attention during the free roam minigames, if you head to the supply closet, somewhere I don't believe that Shadow Freddy brings you, you can see the same supply room from the first game. However, going off script doesn't help you just to see a nostalgic location. Actually, it can reveal something even more sinister in the form of a child's skull on the shelf in the background. Yeah, in a series all about missing children, we get one of their skulls right behind us as we head up to be dismantled by the purple guy. I mean, I guess we're the dead child in this scenario, because we've already possessed the animatronic. So does that mean that it's our skull, and that's why we don't pay attention to it? Or is it because we were killed, so we know it would be? Halfway through at number 5, you won't get tired, will you? In Ultimate Custom Night, the 7th FNAF game, there are a whole bunch of voiced lines that play after you die, depending on the character that killed you. You can get a range from long-winded stories dedicated to Magpat, to lines basically damning you and criticizing you for killing a baker's dozen of kids, rightfully so, but for me, they're all brave. However, there is one line that would stick out to those who played FNAF World, at least through Update 1.2 when Foxy Fighters got added, where Toy Chica said, you won't get tired of my voice, will you? Well, it depends. If you keep talking like that, yeah. If you take off your beak, also, yes. Oh wait, I guess it doesn't really depend. 
In Ultimate Custom Night, if Toy Chica kills you, you can potentially hear her say, you won't get tired of dying, will you? Which is both a reference and serves as indication that we're trapped here and we'll keep dying over and over again. Fun! If Toy Chica is there, I don't know if it's hell or heaven. No, it's definitely hell. I'm not Eddie. Hey, mommy. And then four paper plates. Let's take a break from FNAF 3. In FNAF 2, on one of the cams, you can see three paper plate crafts that resemble the three main animatronics. Sometimes, though, they can take on a mind of their own. At least, the bonding one does. It can sometimes not appear on the camera view and then just later appear in your office. How did it get there? Who placed it there? Was it an animatronic? If it was, why didn't they attack us? Was it a phantom animatronic? Can they even do that? Is this plate animatronic possessed? Was a kid stuffed into the paper plate bag? Like, I know this is a horror game, but like, come on! Nobody else is working there at that time, and so how the hell did this thing move? Oh, and uh, also it could have happened in FNAF 3, too. It was a short one, but it was a break nonetheless. Getting close to the end in number three, staff only. Near the end of the trailer, before the security breach logo, we see Vanny pop out from behind a door labeled staff only, indicating that she is a staff member. But why is staff an acronym? The term staff is used in many different ways, as a plural noun, adjective, and even a verb. But none of those uses use the term like an acronym. In fact, when I searched for the acronym, even with quotation marks, nothing came up. So this is definitely something odd. What could this acronym stand Stand for? And is there actually a meaning behind it, or is Scott just giving us a red herring? Let me know your theories down below. And ultimately, at number two, Living Proof. Let's take another break from FNAF 3. Okay, that's enough. In FNAF 3's minigames, we see the story of how Springtrap came to be. We see Afton dismantle the animatronics and then unintentionally release the spirits of the dead children, who then come to spook him or get an apology. I don't know what the ghosts of five dead kids are gonna do aside from keep you in hell for all eternity until you escape by mind melding with VR video game testers. Anyway, as we see from the game, Afton gets scared by the spirits and then runs into a spring bodysuit to feel more powerful, probably hoping it would scare them because it was this character that killed them in the first place. However, thanks to the water dripping in from the outside, coupled with Afton's haste, he ends up getting snapped by spring locks and collapses. I've seen many comments over the months we've been talking about FNAF where people say that this is where Afton died. This honestly has never sat well with me. I always believed he was alive in the suit and now I know why. In this scene, we never see him stop moving. Sure, he could have died and possessed Springtrap like some have suggested, but if that was the case, he would have stopped moving. He also wouldn't have eyes that are full of life like he does in the Springtrap suit since, as I said before, we can see his flesh inside and those eyes are clearly his. Afton doesn't die in this moment, hence why I don't consider Springtrap an animatronic, because Afton is still alive and consciously controlling him. Afton himself is living proof that Afton never dies. MatPat even said it himself in his theory on that game. He said, notice he never stops moving. That's because he isn't dead. He only dies in Pizzeria Simulator after being lured back by Henry and being set ablaze damning him to hell. Finally, in number one, Butterfingers. On the main stage in FNAF 1, we see three animatronics, Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica. When we leave the camera or it decides to cut out for a moment, we can see Bonnie leave and then Chica, and then Freddy doesn't leave until like no, night four or something, right? Well, as the animatronics leave the main stage, they drop their iconic item. Bonnie loses his guitar, Freddy loses his microphone, and Chica loses her cupcake. Why? Where did they go? Do they just leave them on the stage? Did it make it more intimidating? I need answers, Scott. <laughs> Senpai noticed me. Both Scott and Matt had. And at 10, Freddy the Red Nose Jump Scare. In FNAF VR, it is actually possible to be jump scared by a random animatronic that you can't see coming while you're in the main room that you started in the Pizza Party minigame. It appears to be a version of Freddy with glowing red bottom teeth and what look like nostrils to me, but most people are saying eyes. But like glowing in the Photoshop sense, like they only have their outline glowing instead of being bright white on the inside and then glowing outward. It's like when you add a glow to the outside of something. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, just trust me, I, I literally went to, to school for Photoshop. And I make most of the gaming thumbnails. Recently I've been making like all of them, so yeah. I don't know what animatronic this is meant to be, but based on the teeth, it isn't Freddy because he has individual teeth. And it can't be Chica because the mouth shape isn't right, and the nostrils. It's not Bonnie or Foxy either. I really don't know who this could be, but now that I think about it, those are probably eyes. I just like the idea of big gaping nostrils. Just like jump scaring you. And at 9, FNAF 3 Puppet. While we all know the puppet for being present in FNAF 2 and also appearing as hallucinations or a minigame character in FNAF 3, you can actually 
actually spawn him on the camera. While sometimes you can see the reflection of the puppet's legs in one of the cameras, you can also see what looks to be actual puppet parts in Cam 8 in FNAF 3. While sometimes in that same camera you can hallucinate the puppet, if you look just beside the camera 9's box, you can see something that looks to be a mask, with streaks coming out of the eyes and a mouth just below. This could be the puppet, or just a coincidence. Or maybe it's something else that nobody has really cared enough to look into. I think it's the puppet personally. Maybe not a working puppet, but a puppet figure nonetheless. And it ate chewing gum. Chewing gum recently became a big thing in the FNAF series, only to serve as justification as to the links between two characters. But either way, it's still canon that Michael Afton loves to chew gum. So much so that he actually writes about it in the survival logbook and says that he wants to knock the bad habit. Yeah, it was never demonstrated in the games, and was kind of dismissed in the survival logbook until the latest Fazbear Frights book was released, called Step Closer. That proved who the character of Michael Afton was meant to be, the big brother from FNAF 4, the one who was endearingly called Foxy Bro by MadPat and I'm sure others. This was the only reason that that detail was included, to link him to another character. It was never shown in game, not even indicated. During Immortal and the Restless, he would just sit there eating popcorn and he wouldn't have gum anywhere in sight. I mean, I'm sure this wasn't established yet and Scott didn't think of it, but come on! Imagine if this had been right in front of us the whole time. Ha, <sighs> that would have been so good. Scott, update sister location. <laughs> and it's 7, Golden Background. FNAF 3 introduced the mechanic of needing to make repairs. Maybe the ventilation got shut down, or the audio was corrupted, or maybe the camera stopped working. And if any of this happens, the player needs to reboot that system. While you do this, the cameras you see are just static. However, sometimes the static can sometimes show the face of Golden Freddy. Like, dude, I know times are tough having to deal with, like, 15 missing children at this point, but there's no need to turn into a cam girl. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, crap. I'm not getting out of the semi. No matter what, it is indeed possible to see the face of Golden Freddy in the static. It's not clear, it does take some keen observation, but it's quite subtle. But once you see it, you will never be the same. Mostly because you'll have seen it, and that means that you will have changed, because before, you hadn't seen it. Logic. And at 6, Grandfather Clock. Every FNAF game until Sister Location, you needed to survive until 6am. Doing so would have you complete the night and move on to the next one. However, when you complete a night and make it to 6am, you get notified by a grandfather clock. Obviously, most of us were just so relieved to survive that we didn't pay attention to it, but looking back, why would an alarm at the end of our shift be a grandfather clock? It could be perhaps because everything is just a dream, or maybe we have a custom alarm tone on our phone. I know you can customize ringtones on phones. So so perhaps that's why? I mean, you could argue that these games take place before cell phones were common, especially smartphones, but FNAF 3 would for sure take place in an era where phones were common. And Fazbear Entertainment has always been established as a company with technology far beyond its time. So perhaps we can say the same thing for this whole universe. You know, the universe of FNAF has a whole bunch of high-tech tech earlier than it's supposed to. Now we do a number 5, Design Change. This is something I didn't notice until I went into the comments of that trailer. In the summer of 2020, Funko leaked the designs of the action figures for Security Breach, thus leaking the designs of the animatronics. People were pissed about this, obviously, since Scott had specifically told Funko not to release anything. What is it with Funko and leaks? Anyway, the designs of the characters from the gameplay trailer are actually slightly different to those of the action figures that were released. This is most notable on Roxanne's clothes, where Scott moved the black star shapes, and on Monty's guitar, where he removed or made the black stripes smaller. Smaller, at least from what I can see. Chica's guitar is also a lighter blue and mostly white, as opposed to white and a darker blue from the original action figure. And the animatronics in the trailer are properly proportioned. The action figure heads just weird me out. Like the pop figures are fine because it's like it's meant to be that way, it makes sense, but the action figures, it's, it's weird. And for a child. Ah, Bachelor number one. The child eating, capturing, and torturing, killing machine that won the last round of the killing floor. However, for those of you who didn't already know, and I'm sure there's at least a couple of you, the body of Funtime Freddy does indeed contain a child. As evidenced by the wireframe blueprint where we literally see a child inside of his containment chamber. I don't know if that kid is dead or alive, but based on the lack of oxygen, I'm guessing he's dead because, you know, lack of oxygen. But yeah, in case you didn't know, there is literally a dead kid inside of Funtime Freddy. Do with that what you will. 
getting close to the end in a number three, Family Portrait. Family is everything to a lot of people, and while Scott was stuck in a job he didn't prefer and kept failing at making it in the career he really wanted, I can't speak for him personally, but I'm sure his family was helping him get through it. His wife and kids I'm sure are one of, if not the reason he woke up in the morning, so in honor of them and to get some more assets for the game, he used their images wherever he could. Particularly in FNAF 4's hallway, all the pictures on the wall are Scott and his family. And in Ultimate Custom Night, the face of the one you should not have killed is a picture of his son with the contrast cranked to the max. Family is so important and Scott both honored them and immortalized them in his games by incorporating their family pictures into them, which is so sweet and honestly touching. Something that you don't expect to get from a FNAF game. Man, if only he treated Matt Pat like that. And ultimately, in a number two, Help Wanted. During an interview around a month or so ago, a representative from Steel Wool Studios said that there was a detail or easter egg in Help Wanted that hasn't been found. I literally mentioned it last number. With the experience the fans have to tearing these games to shreds, it's almost impressive that we don't know where this could possibly be. We've torn the game to bits, we've boundary broke and data mined, but we still missed it? The interview reads, quote, The FNAF fandom is keen at finding hidden secrets in every Five Nights at Freddy's game, but is there something in Help Wanted that the fans haven't found yet? Yes. Oh, did you expect me to say it? No dice. The same interview, the infamous box was mentioned yet again. Could the two be connected? And where could the secret be hiding? Perhaps in the DLC? Curse of Dreadbear was packed with all kinds of easter eggs and secrets. Could it have been there? Perhaps in the hallway minigame? Or maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Let me know your theories down below, and let Matt Pat know about this, and if he doesn't know already. We all need to put our heads together for this. But like, with reasonable social distancing and wearing masks, obviously. Put our heads together six feet apart, or more. Finally, in number one, the rules. Thank you to Maggie Shannon on yesterday's community post for pointing this out to me as I was scrolling through the comments. The rules for safety in the Fazbear establishments are simple. They appear on posters in the first FNAF game and they read as follows. One, don't run. Two, don't yell. Three, don't scream. These seem pretty reasonable, right? Even if two and three are basically the same thing. But rule four is where it gets weird, so I'll save that for last. Five, stay close to mom. Six, don't touch Freddy. Seven, don't hit. Eight, leave before dark. I would just take it as leave before closing. Rule number four is honestly the weirdest thing and is honestly scary when you think about why they would need this rule. Rule number four is don't poop on the floor. I'm being totally honest, you can look at it in-game. Management even thanks you at the end of the sign. The FNAF fandom page has better rules than this. Hell, even most subreddits have better rules than Freddy Fazbear's. And we were all wondering why Afton was killing kids. Because there literally has to be a rule about not taking a wicked growler on the floor. Because if I was to do that, I'd be violating at least three rules. Four, two, and three. I didn't want to have to put it out with my fingers, because... I would have failed that massively. Four, two, and three. No, there, can't do it. <laughs> In a tent security room. In the shot of the security room where Gregory stands after all the cameras shut off, we see the screens flickering static as if they were unable to show video. However, a closer look actually reveals that these cameras are showing images in the static. Some contrast and brightness tinkering can reveal a slightly clearer picture, but we can't be exactly sure of what it is. To me, it looks like a really blurry version of the supply closet from FNAF 1, at least one of them does. I have a feeling that the glitches are versions of cameras from previous games, and I wouldn't put it past Scott. There are other images that are really really blurry, like really low quality ultrasounds, but if you have any ideas as to what these secret images can be, let me know down below. In at 9, Vanny glitches. During the scenes focusing on the individual animatronics on the elevator, there is text that shows up between each shot. These say when fear takes hold and reality fails, the stage is set and insanity prevails. Each line of text glitches onto the screen, but within those glitches are hidden images of the antagonist of this game, none other than Vanny, the reluctant follower of William Afton. There are two images that that are shown, one of her looking to the left and the other of her looking towards the center. The eyes that linger over these glitches also always appear above her head. Having these images be glitches on the screen obviously is a reference to Glitch Trap, and having eyes above her head is symbolic of being watched. So could Glitch Trap be watching her through these animatronics, making sure she's doing her job? They all have red eyes after all. 
Only time will tell. And it ain't Shadow Bonnie. During the scene where we see the first alcove containing the animatronics, we see Chica rocking on her guitar. Firstly, this appears to be the home of the animatronics while they're not working or during the night. But no matter how dumb that is in, from an AI perspective, there is another thing that is slightly odd about this little room. There seems to be some form of microphone or perhaps some other electronic attached to her desk that while having a light directly on it is still pitch black. It is also in the rough shape of Shadow Bonnie as they appeared in FNAF 2. It's it's not perfect, but it's still noticeable if you're looking for it. This could be a coincidence, or a nice nod to a character that will be appearing in this game, like how Scott made Chica's party world for sister location. And 7 Realistic Baby Continuing on about the books and their connections to the games, Baby could very well be a realistic version of Henry's dead daughter Charlotte who goes on to possess the puppet. Which would totally be weird because Baby was also possessed by Elizabeth Apton. In the final FNAF novel The Fourth Closet, which is the final novel, the rest are collections of short stories, it's revealed that the main character of Charlie is the last in a series of robots meant to recreate Henry's daughter who was killed at the age of three. This character is also revealed to be the baby animatronic that can switch between looking hyper-realistic like a normal human, to the normal circus baby we all know and love, with the use of small pins with balls on the ends. And what do we see the circus baby model in the FNAF games? Small pins with balls on the ends. This is something incredibly interesting and revolutionary to the story of the games, but not in like a lore breaking kind of way, it just shows that baby could look like whoever she wanted to be, and perhaps that's why she led Ennard. But after she couldn't do it anymore because she lost the pins, she was kicked out. I don't know, it's just a theory. A circus baby theory. I blew out the mic. And it's six, the eyes. There is a scene where we are running through maybe what can be thought of as a maintenance tunnel, probably below the pizza plex. We don't know if anything is chasing us, but we can guess so since this shows over the line they won't stop hunting you, none of them will stop hunting you, suggesting that we are in fact being chased. Now at the very beginning of the scene to the left of the screen, on the very edge we see some lights. However, as our character runs, the fence or railing beside us cuts that light into two separate dots, very reminiscent of the eyes of good ol' Golden Freddy, the one who will not rest torturing Afton's soul in hell. While this may just be a coincidence, we know Scott doesn't do that sort of thing. There were probably multiple shots of this scene, and he would have chosen this one because of that tiny detail. That may have been a mistake, but now I can't unsee it. Halfway through at number 5, Nicknames. The news clippings at the end of the FNAF games always focus on one article. The place getting shut down, the place reopening, the place burning down, and in the first two FNAF games the stories on the outside weren't actual articles. It was just some random text meant to fill up the space. It's commonly referred to as lorem ipsum, at least it was when I was in school. However, in FNAF 3 Scott decided to include some of the story of him creating the games for the fans with the more powerful glasses in the world. One article talks about how his last attempt at becoming a game designer was a toss-up between a remake of his first game, a sequel to another one of his games called Desolate Hope, and an entirely new game about animatronics and pizza. He went with the latter obviously, and that was probably the best decision he ever made. However, later on he also reveals that the iconic names of Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, and Foxy were just nicknames he had in development. He would call them that before actually coming up with their real names. However, after calling them that for so long, he grew attached to the names and ended up keeping them. Probably another good decision if I'm being honest. Can you imagine what it would be like if Bonnie was named, like, Albert or something? Actually, that would be scary. And for Ballora's theme. Over the footage of us being shown the individual animatronics of Chica, Roxanne, and Monty, we hear some music that would potentially be triggering to fans who played Sister Location. Here's the clip. This is very reminiscent of Ballora's theme from Sister Location. Not the song she sings, but rather her theme music that has no lyrics. This is more of a remix version of the song instead of the original, but it could be a hint at something much more. Like Vanny says at the end of the trailer, there is more going on here than you realize. It then cuts to something else, and that makes us think that that's what's going on that's more, but we realize that. So what if this truly means this could be in the introduction of William Apton's wife? Ballora is used as an allegory for his wife, not being possessed, Ballora isn't possessed, but just as a mother figure to the mini Renas and even kind of baby if you look at it that way. And if you do, the connection only grows since baby is possessed by Elizabeth Apton, William's daughter, or was. We don't know what happened to his wife, she has no official name. Some think she died naturally and that drove him to killing, some think William killed her, others think she ran away after learning about what William does. Maybe we will learn more about her in this game. Maybe she is indeed the security guard. Maybe her name is Vanessa. Maybe it's just because that music is creepy. 
Who knows? Unit yeah, three, it's me. Yeah, look, I rhymed. There is one FNAF VR Easter egg that we haven't found yet, but there is also a FNAF VR Easter egg that very few have found. The one only a few have found is the It's Me Easter egg from the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, where if you manage to get three clown posters in the victory barn, and then hit them all with a dart, the barn flips into blacklight rave mode, and the banner switches from saying you win to It's Me in reference to Golden Freddy. We don't know what this could mean. Hell, it could mean that we're still playing as Mike Lapton somehow. But it's also weird because currently Golden Freddy is down in hell with William, torturing him for eternity. So it's unclear as to why this is possible, but it happened nonetheless. At least if we can believe the few videos that are out there. You say Donko found it, but I've seen no video, okay? So, pics or it didn't happen. I need to go back live stream searching for this, though. Like, I, I need to know if it's true. Based on my own experiences. You know, that's the only way we can really know, right? Penultimate lean in number two, purple. The color purple is everywhere in this trailer, no doubt a connection to the purple guy himself, William Afton. The trailer starts off with him speaking, and then he is present throughout the whole trailer. There is purple in nearly every shot, and if there isn't, it's a color that makes purple, blue or red. Plenty of the neon lights are purple, purple is a common secondary color throughout the Pizzaplex, even the logo that shines on the wall is purple. Chica's playpen has plenty of purple, the Pizzaplex alcoves have purple, Chica's guitar is purple, Roxanne's leg warmers are either a dark purple or blue blue, but she's also wearing a red shirt. Monty's gloves and shoes are purple. The only animatronic that doesn't seem to have purple on them is Freddy. Maybe this indicates that he isn't under Afton's control. Everything in this trailer for the most part is related to the color purple. The logo is red and the text is glowing blue. Not to mention the ending with, finally, in a number one, the arm. The final shot of this trailer is clearly a reference to William Afton. I know you noticed that. But what you might have missed, however, is the reflecting purple light that we can see in the reflection of his arm, throwing any theory that this is the Stitch Wraith out the window. At least, maybe. The arm also appears to have been melted at some point, or has had something melted onto it, like flesh perhaps, or the remains of a suit that caught fire after being lured there by your son and your former business partner. Hmm? 